If there's one thing that we can be certain about life, it is that life is uncertain. Life can turn on a dime. Tragedy and heartache can lurk in the shadows of the days ahead just as much as unexpected joys can spring to life like a byway wildflower. Sorrow and suffering can blow in like a sudden summer shower. Disappointments and depressions can well up from the deep recesses of our hearts and minds. Suddenly, without warning, events can take place out of the blue that will throw our world into a tailspin. Our greatest desire is control. We think by our advances we can prevent the unfortunately unexpected from happening. But human control is simply an illusion. Things happen without warning. One child falls into the clutches of a massive gorilla and is rescued. One child falls into the jaws of a fierce alligator and is lost. One plane crashes while a train has a near miss. Why did I live? and my childhood classmate Bobby die in a car accident when we were only in elementary school. Is it luck? Odds? Statistics? Probability? Are we really just human pinballs bouncing through a meaningless abyss of chance? No. When we look up at the midnight sky, when we see the wonder of all that is creation, there is something within all of us that wants to peer over the veil of the physical and spy into the possibility of the spiritual. A God that can create all this must be a great and powerful God. And if He wields such might and power over the landscape before me, could He have such power over the life around me? When it comes to the Bible, God's Word is clear. He alone has power over all things. There is someone behind the scenes, working circumstance to His infinite wisdom. He is doing this in your life right now. In every detail, every instance, every crossed path, and every dead end, He's there. But that's not so easily seen. One must look from the distance of history in order to see the fingerprint of divine design. Although there are countless instances where this is possible, people who have walked across the stage of time who, known only to us in hindsight, were ever so caringly guided through each high and low of life to reveal a master's plan. But there are two. Two that shine brightly and vividly reveal a God who works in us to reveal His good pleasure. One a preacher, one a poet one of bold disposition, one of broken despondency, one wounded physically, and one wrecked emotionally. Yet both bear the marks of God's divine hand of providence. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. Bernard Gilpin was born in 1517, the selfsame year that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church house door in Wittenberg, Germany. He graduated from Oxford in 1540. In 1552, he was appointed a vicar, and then later in 1558, he became rector of the Houghton Le Spring. It was then one of the largest parishes in England, covering 24 square miles and over 16 villages. Early in his ministry, Gilpin was a defender of Catholic teachings. But after being exposed to Erasmus' teachings early in his education at Oxford, Gilpin gradually moved towards Protestant doctrine. Yet he could never wholeheartedly embrace either Roman Catholic or Church of England doctrines. Gilpin was known for his straightforward attacks on vices and sin, especially ones that were regularly indulged by those in religious authority. On one occasion, he was brought up on numerous charges only to have them dropped because it was blatantly obvious they were more about malice than heresy. But finally, those charges caught the ear of Edmund Bonner, the Bishop of London, who issued a royal warrant for his arrest. 
when the warrant was served, Gilpin knew that this was his end. He prepared himself for the worst, being burned at the stake. But in the course of his long journey, Gilpin fell from his horse, breaking his leg. He could not continue the journey and was allowed to recover from his injuries so that he could stand trial. During his preaching, Gilpin was often heard to quote Romans 8.28. It was his favorite verse of scripture, a verse that says, All things work out for the good of those that love God. Remembering this, one mockingly asked him if his broken leg would turn out for his good. Yes, Gilpin replied, all things. And that's exactly what happened. His broken leg delayed his trip to London, where Edmund Bonner, under the blessing of Bloody Queen Mary, would look for any cause to put him to death. During that delay, Queen Mary died, and Queen Elizabeth ascended to the throne. Edmund Bonner was deposed and imprisoned for the rest of his days. And Bernard Gilpin was never brought to trial. Gilpin was saved from almost certain martyrdom by that broken leg. He continued to labor for the Lord, characterized by his hospitality and charity. He was known for regularly giving his own cloak to cover someone in need. He gave a permanent home to over 24 boys whom he fed, clothed, boarded, and educated, mostly at his own expense. He poured himself into taking the gospel to the northernmost reaches of Great Britain, becoming known as the Apostle to the North. He faithfully served the Lord for another quarter century before he died. But some hurts are far deeper than the skin. Some hurt as deep as the soul. Such was the case of William Cooper. William was born in 1731, and early in his life he was met with tragedy. His mother died when he was only six years old, leaving a devastating mark upon his emotional well-being. Soon after, he was sent to boarding school by his father, who played little to no role in his life, leaving yet another emotional void in the life of young William. His first bout with deep, paralyzing depression came when he was about 21 years old. It sent him into such a mental breakdown that he could only stare helplessly out the window of his bedroom for weeks. There would be three other mentally crushing bouts with deep depression in his life the last of which he never fully recovered from. It was during this first depressive state that a scene from his childhood resurfaced. When William was 11 years old, his father gave him an essay to read on the vindication of self-murder. It spoke positively on the virtue of suicide. In speaking with his father on the essay, William was opposed to the author's arguments. William remembered his father's silence on the matter and concluded that he sided with the author. This seems to be the scene that planted the seed in his own mind for taking his life. During his first depressive state, he purchased a powerful drug called laudanum. But when he went to take the drug, he found that his fingers closely contracted and were entirely useless. The next morning, he attempted to hang himself on his high bedpost. The structure collapsed under his weight, sending him crashing to the floor. He tried again to hang himself and hung unconscious until the rope broke, sparing his life. It was then that he was admitted to St. Albans Insane Asylum. And while he was there, a Dr. Nathaniel Cotton gently and patiently witnessed to William of the faith of Jesus Christ. And later, he received Christ as his Savior. But unfortunately, that was not the end of his depression, nor of his thoughts of suicide. The stories have told that in the year of 1772, during another one of his manic depressive states, William decided once again to take his own life. Being overcome by emotions of discouragement and gripped by fears that he could not name, he threw on his cloak and walked out the door. A thick fog had covered the area, so he carefully made his way across the pavement and felt for the iron horse head and the ring of the hitching post. Feeling his way to the nearest corner, he entered a horse-drawn cab that was always waiting there. He ordered the driver, to the Thames, sir. William planned to jump from the bridge that spanned the Thames River, but the trip that only should have taken 15 minutes was still incomplete. After an hour and a half, the driver was simply unable to navigate the dark and foggy streets. 
In desperation, William decided to walk and he paid the driver his fare. As he stepped out on the cab, his arm struck a familiar object. It was the iron horse's head to the hitching post in front of his own home. After another hour and a half of wandering nearby streets, he found himself once again standing in front of his own home. Realizing that there was a holy hand guiding his steps away from death, William said, God be thanked for having overruled my foolish designs. It is said that William, who had become somewhat of a poet, penned what has become one of the most beloved hymns of the Christian faith in response to this providence. God moves in mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. During his life, William Cooper would compose some 68 of the hymns, including one of the most beloved songs sung in churches across the world each week, a song the value of which cannot be estimated. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. In both these lives, behind these scenes, we see the hand of God indeed moving in mysterious ways, taking the dark colors of agony and adversity to bring to bear a heavenly light on the canvas of their lives. And although we seldom see the handiwork of our great God in clear lines of distinction, we can know of a certainty that He's there that he is weaving a grand design. And when we are puzzled at the happenings of life, as we so often can be, we can take comfort that God is in control. As in the words of William Cooper, blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. The Apostle Paul said it this way to the persecuted believers in Rome. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. This show is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown, and is brought to you by the fine folks of Much More 520 Radio. You can find out more about this show and other shows at muchmore520radio.com. You can also stop in by our website at forgottenpodcast.com and also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash forgottenpodcast. And finally, Forgotten is now available on various podcasting apps such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. Be sure to stop in at any of these sites and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening.